What's up, everyone? Today, I'm going to go on a coffee extraction rant. We're going to check in on the chat, and we're going to see um, if there are any questions while I'm going on the rant. While I go on this rant, I'm going to brew some coffee for me because I need some coffee. I need, need some coffee, and so do you. So brew up a cup as we get into this. All right, so first, let's see. What if you prefer that taste of your $20 hand grinder than a DF64? Hey, we're going to cover that today, and that's completely okay. All right, so let me get water. So there's this huge thing going on in gear acquisition syndrome and in FOMO and all of this good stuff where people assume they need to buy, buy better equipment, they get better extractions, they get better coffee. There was this narrative that had been pushed in the coffee industry for a long time now that better extraction equals better coffee. And on top of that, a higher extraction is needed for lighter coffees, which is not necessarily the case, and I'll get to that. But essentially what we have is this push for, okay, you can extract higher with these burrs, so you're going to get better tasting coffee. The highest extraction you can get is going to give you the best tasting cup you can have as long as there's no bitterness. So push the extraction as high as you can before bitterness comes in. We have all these kind of theories that have been percolating in the coffee world for many, many years now. And even just recently, or, or currently on Reddit, it's always grind finder, grind finder, grind finder, grind finder. And so you have all of these people pushing you to this specific supposed end game of coffee taste, which is the higher extraction, the more you get into your coffee, the better it's going to taste because we want to taste as much of that daggum bean as we can. But is that, is that really the case? Let me fill up some water and we'll get back to that. <clears throat> so of course, this has been going on for a long time, and you have a lot of big voices in the industry who have been purporting this claim of high extraction equals tastier coffee. And it seems that there's not been too much pushback. Of course, we do have people that anecdotally are like, well, I've been brewing it low for a long time, and I was always right. And sure, maybe you were, uh, and you were following your palate. But a lot of times, it's very easy for us to psychologically get caught in a trap where we want verification from the outside world, even though they're not there tasting our coffee, we feel this need, this burning desire to be validated by people in the industry that we maybe look up to or that might seem to have more experience in you or may professionally be doing coffee for a living. But the thing is, is those people are also fallible. These people are also falling into the same traps that we all do, which is essentially, what do other people say? What does the theory seem to suggest? What does logic tell me? And maybe logic was suggesting that higher extraction was going to give us better coffee because coffee is yum. We only get so much of it in our cup. More should be yummer, right? Well, that's not necessarily the case. All right. So with with nicer equipment here, we're going to go ahead. And let me let me look through this right, right, right through. Let's get to it. RDT or no RDT? Oh, God. Uh, what do you master the most? Lance Barber's espresso blows spots are not equidistant from like, oh, no. That's actually, good, glad you saw that. Um, yeah, so essentially what we have is people chasing nicer and nicer equipment to yeet their extraction higher. But then if I argue, if I make the argument, you don't need a higher extraction for better tasting coffee, then what's the impetus for nicer equipment? Okay, so that's kind of how we're phrasing the problem today. Either we need high extraction, therefore we need better equipment to achieve higher extraction with better tasting uh, coffees, or we don't need nice higher extractions, therefore we don't need nicer equipment. No, actually, we're going to argue for right in the middle, right there. So as I said in the video recently with Sama, where we busted some myths, he was talking about how even in lightly roasted coffees, you're getting at about 20, 21%. You've got about 70% of all of the acids that are going to contribute to positive flavor notes. You've got about 70% of those are extracted in your cup. And at that same exact time in extraction, you've got about 90% of the bitter compounds are already extracted. So the more we push our extraction, regardless of how nice our grinder is, the more lopsided that concentration is going to become. The ratio is going to become, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. At that time, it's 90% of the acids that are contributing and 70% of the bitter compounds. So as we push it, it's going to become more lopsided because we don't have as much to eke out of the goodies. And we've got more to eke out of the baddies. Now, of course, pushing further is not bad. That's not to say don't ever go past 21 because you're mostly getting bitter compounds. No, sometimes bitter is not a bad thing. Think about it. We have bitter in a lot of things. And sometimes bitterness doesn't necessarily mean it's going to show up in this horribly unpleasant taste in your coffee, ruining the cup completely. It can add balance. It can add something else along those lines that 
you know, elevates the cup. So you could have a 24% brew that tastes great. I just would argue it's not as often as you might think. And I also argue that most of the numbers you see posted online are absolute bollocks. All right. So let's not concentrate on extraction. Let's concentrate on the taste of the coffee. Right. All right. So let me get some coffee uh, ready and we will continue this this fun little rant. And I'll, of course, ask questions in the chat for the people watching live and it'll help people that watch the rerun later on. But I'm going to grab a little coffee. What coffee should I drink today? I will drink. Um. Oh, I don't know. I guess I'll do the one that's right here that I'm not even looking at. Um, this is a Stribby from Manhattan. Unlabeled, because that's how we do it. That is how we do it. A little ASMR. A little too much. Too much should never hurt nobody. Nice. Now we're going to do a little RDT. Because, yeah, RDT. If it'll come out of the daggum bottle. Okay. That was, it looked like a ton of squirts, but there's like no water in there. By the way, change the water of your RDT bottles at least weekly, especially if you're not using distilled water in there, because that junk's going to go grody in your bottle. Okay. So keep that in mind. You don't want bacterial growth. All right. Let me get this nice and coarse because this coffee is a little stinker. It's a little stinker on the drawdown. It's like, I don't want to draw down for you. And I say, you better draw down for me. I got a little slow feeder in here. I'm not actually trying to cut my finger off in case anyone's worried. All right. Get on out of there. Come on. All right. That's good enough. All right. Woo. Nice. All right. Let's see. Um, yeah, so with extraction yields, this is something that it, it's just been going on forever. People, you need to extract more. You need to extract more. So the reason that I actually argue you do want nicer equipment if you can afford it is because you're able to, an extraction yield number doesn't really tell us much at all, except for the percentage of the bean we've extracted. It doesn't tell us what makes up that percentage. And depending on your grinder, depending on your extraction, depending on the channeling, the heterogeneity of the extraction, all these things are going to affect what that percentage is made up of. Okay. So we can manipulate what is being extracted based off of a plethora of variables that we kind of have control over. So depending on the temperature of the water you're using, depending on the contact time, depending on the particle distribution, all of these are going to affect that number. So if you take two grinders, okay, two complete, a conical and a flat, you could very easily hit 19% on both of them, but they're both going to taste incredibly different. It's because extraction yield in the long run doesn't really matter. It can help you if you're using a static system where you're using the same grind size, the same water, and every day you want to hit the same thing, and you're not comfortable if you're do, doing it well. If your palate, you want to check the number, that'll probably give you a rough idea. But in all reality, these are more so helpful for studies and not for your home experiment experience. So for so long, people have been measuring, you know, these things at home and they go, oh yeah, I hit 23.8%. I'm doing good. But in reality, that probably tasted not great. Probably tasted muted in the aroma because the concentrations of the highly vibrant aromatics decrease linearly as time goes on and um, in the extraction process. This is in an unreleased paper from Dr. Samo Smirke that I'm excited for to come out soon. And yes, I have an advanced copy. <laughs> you plebes. Getting some of this chaff out. Didn't know you were coming to a YouTube video where I just blow grounds, did you? <laughs> okay, that's good enough. I've got, I'm chaffy. Okay. Now, what do I have to get? I need to get a V60 because that's what I'm going to brew in. Actually, we'll brew in something else today for funsies. We'll brew in We'll brew in something else today if I can find it. Where are you? There you are. Nice. We'll brew in the little Swartz, little Swartz guy. Little Swartz guy. All right. Let me get I got to use a frill paper for this, but we're going to we're going to counteract the the frills. So, 
All right, let me look at chat to answer questions before I continue because I'm like hopping around quickly. Um, per, uh, prefer uh, high end light roast around 17, 19%. Yeah, I mean, which makes complete sense uh, because that's where you're going to get most of that aroma that you're wanting, et cetera. Um, more even extraction. Yes, we should be focusing on more even extraction. Now, and, and the main reason for that, you could have coffee that tastes fantastic and the extraction was absolutely whack. That's obviously absolutely possible. Everything is going to be in different levels of heterogeneity, and you could have some sort of level of heterogeneous extraction and it tastes fantastic to you. The issue is, is that's not replicable, right? So trying to get the best taste in coffee with the most efficient extraction should be hiccup. Wow. Embarrassing much. That should be the goal, right? So you, let's say that you have, you're dialing in coffee and you have a really, uh, you have a shot of coffee that's incredibly channely. All right. It's like spewing everywhere. It's like, it's a fireworks show under there and your machine's all messed up. And you're like, wow, that was terrible, but you try it. And it was like lovely. And then you're like, I, I want to reproduce it, but I don't know how. So then the next time you actually do really good putt prep, you get it and, a, and the shot comes out, maybe even in the same time, the same yield, you taste it and it doesn't taste good, but it was a more even extraction. You knock the puck out, you're looking, there's no black spots on the other one. You had just black rings everywhere on the bottom of the puck showing where water wasn't really touching. And you're like, oh, the even extraction doesn't taste good. I hate even extractions. Let's not go there. But that means you might need to, you know, dial in a different way to try to achieve what you got with that channeled shot that may have tasted good. Like I said, coffee is a weird thing. You could have channeled shots that taste really nice. You could have really even shots that taste really not nice. And so the thing is, is finding the balance because you want it to be replicable and you want to be able to hit it and be uh, and be able to expect what is going to come to that cup. So I'm doing... 16.3. It was random. You saw me just dropping beans in. I don't care. I was going to pull some out to make it an even 16. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, let's see. Consistent workflow uh, is more important than better extraction. Oh, 100%. Consistency is what I always tell people. I don't care as much about workflow if my consistency is on point. All right? Consistency. I want to know what I'm going to get in that cup, baby. That's what I want to know. And don't tell me I can't know that because I can. All right. Uh, sculptor arrives next week. No, oh, wives. Sculptor arrives next week. Sculptor arrives next week and B2B ready to set up. Party due in part to FOMO upgrade itis, but think I'll enjoy the workflow way more than my GCP and Eureka notes. You will enjoy the workflow a lot. Uh, any RDT bottles you coffee lovers prefer? I just, I mean, whatever. Uh, um, any RDT bottles that I prefer? Take your pick. I've got a little box full of them. I don't care. I just use whatever squirts well. Uh, I do, however, like this one. This came with my Weber, and it's because you can beat the absolute poo out of it, and it ain't going to break, all right? Not going to happen. No, not going to happen. Hey, hey, hey. All right. I'll probably clip the mic. Apologies. Um, I'd suggest more about the extraction distribution rather than exactly how high or low the extraction is. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the thing is, though, is people still um, think there is a potential interpretation of this scenario where people could say, well, if I don't need higher extraction, I don't need better equipment. But in reality, better equipment will get you a better extraction, not necessarily a higher extraction. It can get you higher extraction. And there are burrs that extract really highly. And some could extract more highly and taste better than other burrs. And that's just because of the dynamics going on in the extraction. What is being pulled out because of the particle distribution? What is being pulled out due to your water temperature, your contact time? Again, all the variables we uh, we previously uh, discussed. So uh, I, I usually prefer my espressos around 20 to 22 percent. My pour overs around 18 to 20 percent. And it's very rare that it kind of goes outside of those realms. I can enjoy some espressos above that 22 percent threshold. Um, it just really depends on the coffee. But in reality, I'm not getting nearly as much uh, aromatics when I'm going that high. So, uh, you know, it's because aromatics is so much of what we're tasting in coffee, what we're experiencing in coffee, those volatile organic compounds, we want to bottle them up and enjoy them. Let's see. We all blow. You're right. What temper are we at? We're at 90. I'll go a little higher than that. No, I didn't turn you off. I turned you on. Come on, baby, light my fire. You mentioned Zerno probably benefiting from different bird geometries, which got me thinking about what's, what, what is next in birds. Like, why can't I buy 64 millimeter ghost birds yet? Uh, so ghost birds, I'm not that big of a fan of. I find they produce kind of hollow cups, to be honest with you. Okay, here we go. Let me go ahead and tighten up that, that bottom. That is loosening it. Tighten it. 
All right, so this, you can tighten up the bottom and it's going to hold it kind of like in a pulsar, right? So I'm going to do a little, little baby bloom ski. Yeah, I don't have to use much because the bottom's close. You're not going to go anywhere. All right, that was based off of little bunny foo-foo. And I'm going to do a light, light, just little W D T. Not really doing too much in there. Just kind of making sure it's all satched. It's all satched. All saturated. Okay. Um, let's see. How relevant is extraction and taste when it comes to percentage? Could there be some other better value to measure it uh, to get more relatable to actual experience? Sadly, no. And that's because all coffees taste better all over the place. Some coffees need like, like for instance, these really heavily processed coffees typically taste only good at like that 17, 18 percent uh, area. And then some coffees only taste good at the 20, 21 percent. And you can change the extraction method to pull out a different like 19, if it's only tasting good at 21, you could probably pull out a 19 that will taste better um, based off of a different brewing method. But um, whether or not that's predictable is, is, oh, I forgot to release the base. Well, you're seeing me mess up a brew live because I am a crazy person. All right, we're going to open it all the way up. All right, and we're just going to let that, ugh, whatever. I'm just going to go ahead and pour because I've just ruined everything. We're just going to have a subpar cup and it's fine. Actually, it may be fantastic. Who even really knows? I don't know anything. Let's see. I'm just going to pour. Pour. If I talk now, I will forever not hold my peace. I don't know what that means. I'm just pouring until it's all there. I just need coffee, guys. I took a nap with my child just a little bit ago, and I am more grumpy than he. Okay. We're just going to kind of level it out because I don't feel like swirling. We're going to do that. Okay. We're good. We're good now. Um, let's see. I wonder if you could use Everclear for your RDT. That way it would not go bad, possibly reduce static and evaporate in the burr chamber. So I don't believe evaporation is really going on the burr chamber. I mean, I think you're going to have some sort of some humidity buildup, obviously, but I don't, uh, and which I guess would be some evaporation ish, ish. Um, yeah, so I don't think, but, but the, some of the theories I've heard is that, um, at the fracture, it's so hot that it could uh, spontaneously like evaporate the water. I don't think that's really possible to be honest with you because the fracture is along a line inside the bean itself, whereas the water's sitting on the outside. So it's never actually on that. And the heat is produced and dissipated like immediately, unless you have a grinder that's really mashing it and it's allowing heat to accumulate. In reality, it's like crack, boom, it's dissipated. It's gone. It has to kind of stay there for a bit for the water to get up to boiling, even in little specks. So I'm not sure I believe that the water is like intensely ev ev evaporating like some may postulate i gotta change the battery it's already swelling in this oh yeah baby that is swelling i do have batteries on the way so we should be good but um let me close this up so i can set it down it's not gonna make a mess messy 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 throwback to frosty into one of my early videos let me get a cup um you'll do just fine Okay, there we go. Do I personally use extraction to help me dial in? No, because like I said, it doesn't really matter. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. That's from some movie or something. I don't remember what it is. Um, yeah, so I do not use that because um, I tend to... I tend to have just go-to recipes in most things. And then based off of the bean itself, I will consider what type of espresso I'm going to want. So if it's a pour over, I usually just have a go-to, which is typically my V60, like uh, variations of my one to one uh, I, I just change up the bloom time in the pour speed, essentially, um, and the amount of agitation. So I really just go with that. And usually I'm getting, you know, I'm never really pushing past 20% with how coarsely I grind. Um, so I don't use that. At, at that point, I'm just using my palate. When it comes to espresso, based off of the bean itself, I'll decide if I want this as a soup style shot or if I want it as a thick boy shot. And then based off of my mood, I will change up um, whatever style that is, depending on ratio of the style of shot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so no, I don't use them to dial in. I strictly use them for scientific purposes. 
Um, how helpful is measuring extraction? It's really not very helpful at all. It, it helps you, in, it can help you in dialing in in a shop and it helps you obviously when you're running experiments, as long as you can keep everything as static as possible. If you can keep the same system in place, it can be very helpful, but it's not helpful just a priori. There's not really any information it's giving you that can help you other than the percentage of the bean that's being extracted. And even then there is so much faff in the protocol that most people don't have the desire to follow, that they're likely not getting good readings anyway. And then it's really not helpful, right? So while I'm like really excited about things becoming more accessible, and the fact that the RD2 is actually a really solid little, um, is a really solid little refractometer. I have it in here somewhere. I think this is it. Yeah. And the fact that this little guy is actually a really nice little refractometer and is affordable relatively speaking. Um, like that's great and I'm happy, but now you're getting people getting them and they are promulgating this, this theory, uh, which is no good. They're like, oh yeah, I yeeted 26.7% on this washed Kenya from say, um, and it was divine. It was the best thing ever. And the implication is that, oh, you probably can't extract that high. Therefore you're never going to experience what I'm experiencing. And it's this type of it's this type of attitude and uh, just, I don't know, it's this type of negative energy that does, doesn't need to be in the world and a narrative that doesn't need to be pushed that I'm not a fan of. And so like, where I'm, whereas I'm happy these are more affordable, so if people do want to do their own kind of little science experiments at home, because this is a hobby that we're all really nerdy about, you wouldn't be here watching with 51 other people if you weren't an uber nerd. I call this coffee extraction rant and you're here. Obviously, some of you want to do this, but in order to make sure you're getting the proper readings, it does take a lot of cleaning and calibrating and uh, like making sure you're constantly having clean, like you need to always be cleaning, you know, with little, you know, microfiber, little eyeglass wipers. You need to be making sure they're always clean. You need to be having isopropyl alcohol. You need to be uh, having distilled on hand at all times, be calibrating, yada, 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 making sure the temperature's all, it's, it's a lot to take into account. And a lot of people don't do it and they end up taking improper measurements and they balloon. I've seen people report 30% extraction. No, you're not getting 30% extraction. And even if you were, ain't no chance it's tasting good. Like, are you, like, what is the, what's the point even? What's the point? What's, what, what is, how is that a flex? I don't know. Let's see. Do you think it matters what water is used to rinse a filter? Not really. I just use sink water, honestly. And then I will do a one over with my kettle water, but it's more so because, uh, honestly, the main reason is because my, I always am using decanters with little coffee inside of it. I, I just, I, I, I don't know. Maybe that's gross. Uh, I do wash it every now and then, but I'll, you know, I once over it with hot water and it's good to go. And um, so I guess it does wash out the water, the sink water, but my sink water is not bad here. Uh, it's really not that bad. Um, on consistency, do you think that tools like the Moonraker um, or Uminot are more replicable than manual WDT? referring to those two where it's a spirograph pattern, I think it is very, and, and it's slow. I think it is very, 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 hit or miss, depending on if it's better than a specific user. I definitely would argue, not argue, I have data to back it up, but I am better than the Moonraker. Me with the Swartz WDT is better with the Moonraker. The Autocomb, I am better than slightly, but the Autocomb is more consistent. I am as consistent or more consistent than, uh, I am more consistent than the Moonraker. I am not quite as consistent as the autocomb. Um, well, it's very close. I would say I'm, um, it's very close to the autocomb. I haven't finalized numbers for that, but it's very close. Um, autocomb is the most efficient automated one I have found. Yes, I know spirographs are better in theory, and I do spirograph when I'm doing it with my hand, but the autocomb works so quickly and is very efficient, and it just, it just works. Uh, even though they're going kind of in the same pattern, you're moving it around so quickly, it almost turns into like a liquidized, a liquidized form of, of of material. And it does just a really, really nice job. Uh, there is a little tricks to it though, and it doesn't fit with every portafilter. So it's definitely, a, it is made for cafe portafilters. Uh, and you want to make sure it fits yours at home if you're wanting to get one. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite nice. Um, but I still find myself using manual because I'm so I'm in, I'm very consistent with it. I mean, I've the amount of shots I've pulled 
is you would be disgusted um, because of all these, you know, tests I'm running. So sorry for the airplane you may hear in the background. Okay. What's the cause of long pre-infusion? Do I see first drops like 18 seconds and the shot goes fast like 10 seconds remaining time? So, the, uh, well, it depends. Is this happening on every coffee or is it like a specific coffee? Is it a specific grinder? There's a lot of things that I could explain that. Um, it could also just be slow fill. Is your machine dripping out really slowly? Does it have a pre-infusion mode where it's, or is it soft infusion like on the Ranchilio or what's going on with it? Um, it, that would really help me kind of understand that. What's your opinion on golden ratio for pour over? What's your favorite ratio? What's the effect of the ratio? Okay, how to dial with her. So I always, almost always, because I drink very specific coffees, I usually drink really dense washed coffees um, like all the time. And so I, I pretty much always do a one to 17 unless it's um, a, a, like, well, I say one to 17. I, I typically do 15 grams to 250 grams. Easy, repeatable, tasty. Um, and so that's my, that's like my usually go, my usual go-to. <sighs> Sorry, I needed that. That was nice. That's kind of my usual go-to. Uh, but yeah, one to 17 around that is what I like to do. Um, it dep if it's a more developed roaster or if it's like a non-washed process, I'll shorten the ratio a bit to like one to 16 maybe. And if it's even more developed or more funky, maybe one to 15, one to 15.5. And then I make small changes. I don't really change the ratio much. Once I know, if I know the coffee pretty well, and I know I need to be on that ratio, then it's more so a grind size change or a pore structure change or a bloom time change or something along those lines. How'd you grow such a beautiful sash? You have no idea the years I've prayed for, for facial hair. Little insight into my life. I could not grow facial hair for the longest time. And I still really can't, honestly. Uh, and the sad thing is, is I think if you were up close, you wouldn't think my stash was as glorious as it appears on camera. Uh, I don't grow any hair here, any hair here. And the hair that I do grow in the other places, it's like 14 to 17 hairs, like all combined. Um, and the stash, it's just like the hairs themselves are thick. So it looks like it's covering, but probably I have like 63 hairs on my upper lip. It's probably not that bad, but yeah. Also by a fellow home espresso aficionado member that extracting an espresso with a shallower bed was much more efficient than a thicker bed because the water becomes less efficient. That's true. It is more efficient, but it's probably not tastier. And I definitely don't think it's tastier. I much prefer deeper beds. Uh, so that's the thing is you can make as even as possible stratified extraction. But yes, a more shallow bed will give you a more efficient, but it's the same thing in a Kalita, right? If Or, or a flat bottom brewer. I do not like really shallow bed extractions because when you're pouring that water, yeah, it's really efficient and extracting really highly, but it is, um, it is, oh, it doesn't hold the water back very well. You have to go even finer for proper contact time, and it's going to cause a lot of issues that way. There are a lot of ways you can really increase the efficiency of extraction, but those ways are not necessarily the best ways, right? Like, for instance, if you want the highest efficiency ever, if really... I guess I overstated how important efficiency is. Efficiency is important to a, to a degree. So you'll get really efficient extraction if you put French press grounds in a, a espresso machine. Um, I mean, because the course of grounds are the more efficient the waterways are going to be. But there's like balances and checks that we need to hold into account. And so with espresso, there are certain things we're looking for in the cup and you're going to negate a lot of that and you're going to give yourself some unpleasant flavors with the more shallow bed. The more shallow bed, the more resistance it's going to have. The only way to really get that resistance, since you can't rely on bed depth, is going to be fineness of the grounds. The finer you go, the more channeling you'll potentially get and uh, the more bits and doodads you're going to get in your final bed. The bigger, the deeper the bed, the more the filtration effect. So when you have a deeper espresso puck, there's more coffee to hold back microparticles. Oh, I forgot about that. That happened the last time. Man, whenever it's unintentional, it works. But when I try to do it, it doesn't work. Oh, there it goes. Okay, ADHD, sorry. Um... So, that gum and I lost my train of thought. That stupid heart feature. I need to just disable it because it's gonna, it's gonna ruin me. It's gonna ruin me. I have no idea what I was talking about. Okay. Oh, depth of bed. Yeah, and so that that bed, that puck's gonna become a lot less efficient in filtrating uh, in, in in filtration. Um, so yeah, shallow pucks are fine. I but I would recommend if you want to do a smaller dose to get a more narrow basket, something like how Swartz has made that fifty-eight millimeter diameter but forty-nine millimeter base basket. That way you can get more depth with smaller doses. Um, depth is a very important thing. 
and it allows for a more interesting extraction. And you can still be efficient with that. That's the thing is you can still be consistent with that. It's consistently going to stratify the extraction, kind of like a V60. So I guess it depends on your definition of efficiency, right? I was wondering if you'll do an episode about pressure flow profiling for espresso in the future. I think we've come a long way since a decent launch and it's a complicated topic. Well, I did talk about pressure and flow profiling in a video recently. It was like a 40, no, like a 25 minute video on the differences between them, the similarities. Um, so I have done something like that at extracting compounds as it travels through the puck, gets saturated. What do you think about that? What thought would you make a video covering that? I found it interesting at extracting compounds as it travels through the puck. I don't know if I understand that at extracting compounds as a true. What do you think about that? So the, the compounds that are extracted traveling through the puck. Uh, I'm not sure I understand that. Sorry. Um, um, I said in the pressure profiling video, it's just complex. So maybe just showing. Maybe. So when you're talking about the pressure profiling question, are you just asking to um, show examples of them? You can change batteries on the lunar. Yes, you can. I'll show you a deconstructed lunar. This is this is scary. I think it's still deconstructed. Or did oh, Ugo put the base back on? Or did I put the base back on? I don't know. Anyway, I'll show you the battery. Here's the battery. And as you can see, it's like the... the uh, marshmallow man. You see how fat that is? This thing should be thin. Should be a little thin boy. But you see how fat that is? It's been eating its Wheaties. Okay. That is a good old Southern boy right there. All right. That thing is like a Tide Pod. We don't need that in our Akaya. And so what can happen is it'll balloon and it messes the weighing scales and eventually it just explodes and dies. And so, yes, you can replace your battery. And actually, I've discovered that the battery being swollen can also affect the Bluetooth reading. So that was my, and, and it can affect the turn on time. So the way I noticed my battery was failing is I would turn on and it would take forever to turn on. And I was talking to an Akaya rep and they're like, yeah, your battery is starting to die. I was like, oh, well. That's cool. Let me get some more bats. Let me get some more batres. All right, let me put this back up. That's what a swollen battery looks like. What filters am I using? I'm using, in this cup, that was the ones from Swark, so I'm not quite sure actually where he sources his filters or if he somehow makes them, but how to increase florality in espresso. Well, it has to be there, first of all. But second of all, I find the most florality in shorter shots that are uh, like turbo shots. I would get a lot, you get a lot of florality in like turbo shots. You can get them in more standard uh, espressos. Just make sure you're smelling it right when it's done pulling. Those VOCs are like, they're having a party and running away as quickly as possible within the first like 10 seconds. So the longer the shot is, the more VOCs are escaping your cup as it sits there and as that strain is coming out, that stream is coming out. Thoughts on negotiator with Kalitasol filters. Yes, I, I think you should do it. I love it. Is that the new dye fluid? Yes, that was a new dye fluid, and it does a good job. Um, extracted 100%, just eat the puck. I am a terrible parent, and I tricked my kid to take a little tiny nibble of a puck. It was very funny, though. Worth it. He's six. He can handle it. 30%, why not just eat the bean? I know, right? I've been looking at the dye fluid R2. I know that you found the consistency was off the old one. Yes, the, the old... Um, the old dye fluid was awful. This new one is much better. If you're in a shop though, I would probably recommend getting something more robust and see if you can save it for a VST. Um, just because things in shops tend to get a little irky, irky, murky. I'm better man than than I need. V60 is my go-to brewer. Yes. Someone asked if that would consider it my go-to. Yes, it is my go-to. What do you think about WD, double WDT? God, that is a mouthful. What do you think about WWD, WWDT? I like that, actually. Um, once in the dosing cup and once in the basket. Jonathan Gagne seems to think that is a good way to improve extraction. Oh, I, that, I do that. Um, that is something that I do. Um, I very frequently do that. So, um, yes, I do think you should do that. And, in fact, I like using thicker needles when I'm doing it in the dosing cup. Um, so I like to use like thick boy needles in the dosing cup. Like I, they're not even really acupuncture needles. They're closer to like friggin' paper clips. So I like to have, it's honestly sort of like a whisk. You cut a whisk and you just sit there and you stir those mom, mama jamas, dump it in the cup, then properly WDT. Good. Um, let's see the shallow deep compared to espresso baskets as well. Yeah. So the shallow deep thing was, I was talking about espresso baskets. 
unless that is a different comic because I'm really behind on comments. What other measurements tools for quantifying coffee taste do you know of? Are any stolen from other food sciences and might they one day become common in home kitchens? So really you have bricks. You can measure bricks and then divide it by 1.19 and get your TDS. Um, so if you get a, I would not say a cheap bricks reader is going to give you accurate readings, but a Tago does have a $1,000 bricks reader. And I think it is arguably just as, I think it is just as accurate as something like a VST. And it's a lot more forgiving. Uh, at least based off of the day I used it. On one day, I pulled like 60 shots using that. And it is so daggum forgiving. And it has a temperature, um, the thing that like changes the, what is it called? It's essentially so you don't have to let the espresso cool down. It re reacts to the temperature and changes, recalibrates it based off the temperature. It's very nice, but it's like 1,000, 1,100 bucks. But you can use bricks, divide by 1.19. Um and you can do that with a cheap bricks reader. Just don't go like posting your numbers online. It, you would need to get a repeatable bricks reader and make sure it's repeatable by doing the tip, typical test of dissolving certain things and measuring it on uh, numbers you know the bricks of and, and, and then measure the same espresso a few times, et cetera. But then you can get at least consistent numbers. And even if they're not the right numbers, you can still see it is what I'm doing, increasing or decreasing extraction, et cetera, et cetera. So... Um, but yeah, uh, you, the other things you have to use like gas chromatography, uh, in order to delineate certain things you need to use. Um, it, it's a lot, it's things that only can really be happening in labs, uh, to be honest with you. Um, make the heart sugar with latte art. Oh, LOL. Um, Examples of flow profiling would be great. How to do it with, say, a GCP with a dimmer mod. Show different recipes for different roast levels. Yeah, no, that would that would make sense. I, I'm about to do the Gajuino project. I have everything in now, my, the kits. So before, I do have... <laughs> I've got all the parts to do it from scratch. And then I was like, God, that's going to take a long time. And I, it's really hard with ADHD to, like, set aside, like, to plan five days straight of just working on one thing. And so I kept delaying it, kept delaying it. And then zero bit was like, Hey, someone is now selling kits where they've like pre-soldered everything. And I was like, Oh heck yeah, I'll buy that. And then it took me a couple months to remember to buy it. And then I bought it and now they're in. And my plan was to do it this weekend and I still may do it this weekend, but we'll see. Um, I plan to do it soon though. Uh, see you Devin. Um, you should check the monster store near company down for batteries. So I actually got them. Akai is sending them to me for free. They're really nice. I talked to them at Expo, and I think that they, I think that mine fried really early uh, for how long I've had it. I've only had that lunar for like a year and a half. Um, and so they were sending that to me because, um, yeah, it pretty much fried. Um, yeah. Yeah. So examples of flipper. Yeah, I already said that. Um, I hate how high extraction coffee is so pungent. Is there a way to get clarity like that's like smooth? I don't know. I'm a real beginner. I would not do high extraction. Don't do high extraction. Don't do it. You're going to get more bitterness with high extraction, period. Even if it's a good extraction, you're going to get bitterness. There's no, that's the other thing. People think you, there's a way to extract really highly without bitterness. That's not possible. That is chemically not possible. Now you may not, it may not be at a threshold that's bothering you, but in order to get a really high extraction, you will necessarily get a higher concentration of bitter components. That's happening. That is not negotiable. That is happening. Okay. Okay, we've got that. All right. So uh, that was not that was not at you, by the way, Cameron. That was at the people. Okay. What's your opinion on chill portafilter Berg Wu technique? I mean, it's it's fine. Uh, the thing is, is the portafilter actually is not doing too too much to the extraction of the coffee unless you have a unifilter because the basket is just barely touching the portafilter. It's the temperature of the basket that means the most. So for so long we've been taught that we need to superheat our portafilter, but in reality we just need to warm the basket. Okay, unless it's all connected, in which case that whole portafilter does need to be hot. So with the unifilter, you need to heat the ish out of all of that. With a normal portafilter where the basket's just holding on to the rim, you just need to warm it. Just hot water over it, and that's as good as it needs to be, honestly, because the basket's so dynamic due to how small the thermal mass is, that doesn't super matter. With frozen portafilters, doesn't really make much difference. The frozen basket will make a slight difference, but it's going to reach temperature really quickly. So it might help early on, but quickly it's going to go up, right? Because how thermally dynamic that small bit of... Like the frozen pour filter is not going to keep that basket cold whenever hot water is being poured into it. It's not. So, yeah. 
Did I miss my question getting answered regarding V60 and super fast extracting coffee stream lag on my end? Oh, maybe not. I don't remember that question. Um, I'm trying to, I'm like speed reading through these and I'm missing some probably. How long does a set of Lotus water last for you? I find it very expensive compared to TWW, but I'm wondering if it balances out in the long run. So it, it should not be expensive compared to third wave water. We actually priced it so it was actually cheaper per cup than third wave water. And it lasts a long time. I'm still using mine from over a year ago. I got these, I brought these with me when I moved here. So uh, they last in perpetuity. And Samo has backed this, um, Samo Smirke. He has backed in. He, he doesn't see any reason why they won't last like in perpetuity as well uh, because of their concentration and the way that they've been uh, distilled, et cetera. So it's um, or, or clarified. Sorry, I said distilled. Obviously, they're not distilled. Uh, clarified. Uh, so they should be fine. I've not had issues. Is there anything stopping me from doing the Gajuino on a Gaja baby? That is something you should ask zero bit. I'm not familiar. Uh, I've not done much with Gaja baby uh, and maybe it's fine. You taste a lot of espresso and pour over at WBC. Can you describe the type of espresso and pour over that you've tasted and the similarities in this kind of competition? Yeah, so in, in competition, what you have is a heavy focus on clear delineation of loud flavors. So competitors are constantly going out to source the most loud coffee they can find. Louder, the better, okay? So they're going out and they're finding this triple anaerobic 400-hour washed in a cascara bath, then yeast fermented with frogs for 96 days. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to find the most process-driven cup because a, cu a cup of coffee that tastes like it could actually be coffee is not going to win these competitions. They're just not. I've tried... So many of these finalist coffees, I've helped people dial in at these. I've coached two world runner-ups. I'm telling you, normal coffee will never win that competition. What we taste at home will never win that competition. What wins those competition is essentially the most processed forward, the most funky you can get in that cup. I have had so many insanely shower, shower, insanely sour warhead shots that are so intensely lemon and perfume and um, sage and clove and like passion fruit and mango but these sound good when you're when you have a coffee head on you're thinking passion fruit oh i've tasted passion fruit this one coffee and it was good no i'm saying like in your face intense punchy passion fruit that you'd get in a cocktail all right so these are things they're looking for these loud expressions because they're trying to dumb it down as much as possible for the judges because the idea is you want your flavor calls one of the main parts of scoring especially in brewer's cup the main part is making sure your flavor calls that you're calling matches with what the judges are independently getting. So of course, psychology plays into effect. You tell them the flavor notes you want them to get. You're telling them this is what you will taste. And then they're going to taste it and they're going to put on the score sheet what they taste. So obviously when they hear you suggest something, if you suggest a lot of red fruits, they're likely going to be tasting red fruits. They may disagree on which ones, but it's highly arbitrary what they're doing, right? Because they're essentially still at your mercy. So if you're really good at understanding sensory science and psychology, you're likely going to do well as long as you have a coffee that is so loud that like, for instance, you want to, like a lot of times I coach people on getting a coffee that has a very specific color that everyone that tastes it is getting regardless, like blindly. So if they're tasting it, everyone is saying like it's strawberry or it's, um, you know, uh, like, um, oh my God, I can't think of red fruits right now. It's cherry, it's strawberry, it's um, other red fruits, red currant, whatever. Um, if everyone's tasting red, then that's good for you because then you know pretty much any of these flavors you shout out, they're going to probably taste it now because you're, everyone's tasting red. It's pretty apparent that it's red. And so you can call pretty much any red notes and they're likely going to give you some points because they're like, yeah, it's pretty close to that. So the idea is manipulating the system in order to optimize your points based off of flavor scores. So the more loud and apparent you can get a note, the better it is. So if you have a passion fruit processed coffee and you call passion fruit, they like cannot say it's not in the cup. It is objectively in that cup. And so the more insanely intense flavors you can get, the better it is for the competitors. Same in barista. And so, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, I started to use your one-to-one -one technique some months ago. This week decided to went back for multiple pours and extractions. No way. One-to-one -one for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One-to-one. -one. Of course, you want to, you know, ch change the bloom up. Sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes two minutes, depending on the coffee. But yeah. Uh, you've had that particular set for over a year and you still have some left. That's crazy. Okay. Well, no, it's not this particular set. It's, uh, I brought them all with me from the U.S. when I moved. Not this particular set.
I'm just pulling out my empties. It's not my particular set, all right? So I, I just brought a lot with me when I moved. I didn't want to ship overseas. And yes, we are working on a solution for refills without having to get all this glass. But that's why I'm keeping it, is I'm going to do something with them. I don't know yet, but anyway. Um, recently, I had an Ethiopian natural, and I couldn't get it to work using one to one recipe despite trying high, low ratios. Uh, well, it should work. So essentially, with an Ethiopian natural, depending on the roast level, I would go a little coarser. And maybe maybe you need to have... Uh, well, it depends on how the cup was tasting, but the thing is... Um, Yeah, it, 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 I was reading your comment about the trying Hoffman's method. Yeah, it really depends on um, what the cup was tasting like. You can, uh, with one to one, that's what I'm saying is it's more of a guideline than a specific recipe. It's more so saying you want to do two pours, get all your water in. And so maybe it, it, like maybe you needed to pour more slowly with more t turbulence uh, for that second pour. Like slow it down so there's more contact time and you have more turbulence going on. But um, who really knows? Uh, how do you deal with coffee that extracts in extremes with regards to time? Coffee straight up, letting water through, or the opposite? Any methods or recipes? How do you deal with coffee that extracts in extremes with regards to time? Like it, 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 it it's really long. Coffee's straight up, letting water through, or the opposite? Oh, either it's going through really quickly or going through really long. Any methods or recipe? If I notice it's going through really quickly, and it's a coffee like by a roaster I know, and so I'm, you know, I go a certain course and it's going through a lot quicker than I imagined. I might break up my final one pour into two different pours to give a little extra agitation to slow it down a bit. Or I might just try it and see if it's good. Uh, but, uh, or I'll just elongate the bloom. If I notice during the bloom, it goes through quickly. I may just let it sit there for a while and let that water really work its way into the center to help with the extraction. So th there's a lot of different ways to combat that. When it comes to long ones, I will if I notice the bloom takes forever for the water goes through, I'm not going to go for a heavy turbulent pour. I'm going to get all the water in there using a, a laminar pour where I'm just like tossing it in there, trying not to um, try not to uh, essentially add, add as much turbulence, which can be really rough in the bottom of the bed and can slow it down even further. And I'm doing a nice laminar pour, getting it all in there essentially as quickly as possible. You think what going in competition with some fresh clean? Yeah, going with a washed Panama geisha is suicidal. Yes, it will not do well. Sadly, um, are these really loud coffees always going to be like astringent? I don't know what that means. I just if you if you extract them to twenty plus percent, they will be astringent. Oh yeah, oh yeah, baby. Um, let's see. Do you have any tips for dialing in with the unifilter with paper filters? Because with paper, it runs even quicker. Still grind for nineteen or seconds. Still fifty five grams out. Um, no, if you're doing paper filter, I'd go even faster time. If you're trying, if you're into soup style shots, you do like a fifteen second shot. Why not? Um, the paper filter and bottom will make it go faster. And I would not recommend grinding too much finer um, because you're still getting, you're not getting nearly as many particulates when you use paper filter. It's one of the advantages of it, but you could, the finer you go. So why take that risk? You know what I mean? Um, um, how long does a set of four last when you're mixing compared to a pack of 12 packets of TWW? So it's more so how many, the math we did is based off of gallons per unit or per price. Yeah. So um, I don't remember the math, but essentially you can get uh, more gallons of water using a standard recipe of like, I think using simple and sweet, we did the math. So if you made simple and sweet with our bottles, you would get more gallons than you would with the same price worth of TWW. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say buy loads because third wave bar is easier and whatever. But uh, um, yeah, that was like a big thing for me is I wanted to make sure we were on par in pricing. So yeah. Uh, starting to process the practical takeaways from your video on the new Hinden paper. How are you practically applying this info in your home route, uh, at home routine? So essentially, uh, that's a great question. So I, I was, I was, hesitant to say I was I, I incorporated this maximally or minimally in my home routine because I don't want to influence people to actually do it who don't want to do it. And that's why I was talking about the condensation I saw in the niche and how it could potentially do something to your grinder. And I kind of want to just leave it up in the air for people to like experiment if they wanted to or not. But essentially, you're able to get really interesting effects, obviously. And I think it can help. I think it can help grinders like the niche have a better particle system um, and potentially better tasting espresso. Now, when it comes to higher dollar uh, grinders, 
I don't think it's like, I don't think it's necessary with any of it, obviously, but it will improve your efficiency and can improve the consistency of your shots and can improve your uh, bed packing, essentially. So you can go a little coarser. So that's always a huge plus is if you can grind a little coarser, you can get a better particle distribution and you're going to get better flow through the puck. So if you can go a bit coarser, have a... Um, less fines created, have better, uh, you know, uh, unimodality, all these things, potentially you're going to get better tasting coffee. So that might really help with the niche. But practical effects is experiment. If you, if it tastes better, include it. If it doesn't, don't. If you're already WD or RDTing, add an extra couple squirts, see if that's helping. The good thing with like the niche and things that cause a lot of turbo electrification is it looks like you don't need nearly as much water to get the benefits. Um, like in James's video, he only tested with 20 microliters. And so when he did his testing and he was seeing longer extraction times, but not increasing extractions, that was very similar to my experience with cheaper grinders at that 20 microliter. That's why I tried 10 microliters per gram. And that's where I saw the massive increase. So with the niche, you only needed 10 microliters to get the optimal results with it. Whereas with um, the EK, it took more water, right? So anyway, um, how do you feel about calculating extraction level just by drying out the coffee after brewing and weighing it? That is a great way. In fact, it's a very efficient way, obviously. Um, and in fact, that is the way that it is done uh, to standardize refractometers in labs. But it is very difficult and you have to be very careful not to lose anything in like on the way. But yeah, oven drying is fantastic. Thank you for the answer regarding super fast flows. Yeah, some companies that seem to offer zero resistance. Yeah, absolutely. SSP bar is a substantial upgrade from OGEN. Two boards, there's money better spent on upgrading to a different grinder. So this really depends on your scenario. Um, I, I, you know, helped develop the OGEN 2. Obviously, the goal was not to beat SSP MP because that, like, they wanted a general burr that will be great for the populace, right? So not everyone is going to enjoy the SSP MP. So if you're into high clarity, if you're into that style of coffee, then it is a big upgrade, I think. Um, James doesn't think so as much. James says that it would like, they were similar, um, which is great. I love that. But I definitely think that they're a little bit more blended, uh, and maybe, um, yeah, a bit more blended. They're still really clean burrs and really great. And I stand by them, but, um, the SSP multi-purpose definitely give you something different and def something more, um, for me, at least with my taste preferences. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Ode is a solid grinder though. It is a solid grinder. So you know, uh, it depends, I guess, how old yours is, what your budget is, what you might be thinking of getting. If you're only thinking of upgrading to like an $800 grinder, I would not recommend doing that. I'd say just get a $200 burger, pair of burgers. Um, all right. I was going to do a Bagajuino build, but after adding all the parts, about 70% towards the meticulous with the product and it's meticulous it is. Well, the thing is with the uh, Gajuino build, you don't need a Akaya. You can build with cheap parts, your own built-in scale. So that's one of the big parts of the Gajuino is you can actually build your own scale that does uh, brew by weight with it. So you don't need an Akaya with it. You can build your own scale with AliExpress parts and doodads. So it's like 10 bucks to build your own scale. So that brings the price right back down, eh? Uh, sorry if you missed this question earlier, but have you seen or used the DF83V? No, I've seen it. I've not used it. Just got the DF83V2 less than two months ago. Should I have buyer's remorse? Strictly use for espresso. No, don't have buyer's remorse. Don't have buyer's remorse. That's that's what I'm always trying to say is, honestly, if it's built well, probably the DF83V will be a bit better because of its auger feeding system. But... Is it better enough to have buyer's remorse? No. Is it better enough that you would tell a massive difference? No. If you slow feed your beans into your DF83, you're going to have the same experience. It really doesn't matter. It's just maybe it'll be easier with the DF83V because you can dump it all in at once and it'll, it'll be a little bit more meated. But I looked at the auger in pictures and it's a little baby fat auger. It's a little... It's a little one. So you're not getting that much of a benefit. It is a benefit, of course, but it's not that much. If you just slow feed, if you get a slow feeder, so like on my EK, for instance, it does have an auger, so I don't need a slow feeder. But I put a slow feeder in it. I don't know if you can kind of see that. There's a little hole right here. That's the only way to get out. Oh, actually, you can see if I do that. So I put this slow feeder in there. So beans have to go through this little hole in order. To, so it slows down the feed a lot. You could do something like that on your DF83. In fact, this is the DF83 puffer. So I bet you, you could get something like this and put it inside the puffer and you've got a slow feeder and then you're fine. Honestly, just slow down the feed rate and you're going to have the same experience as the DF83 V2. I wouldn't worry about it. So don't have FOMO. This is, um, what, um, 
What upgrading my uh, Mazer Type A electric something like Zerno improve efficiency and taste much better for medium versus espresso? It will taste better than the Mazer, absolutely. Uh, the Mazer tends to crush pretty badly, and the burrs that are stock are not very good. Uh, but honestly, if you're drinking medium, it depends on the medium. If you're if your medium is actually kind of dark, you may not have that big. Well, no, you still have a big difference because one of the big issues in grinding, especially on Mazers, is they're mashing the beans so much with those horizontally set burrs that. Um, and the feeding is so inefficient that it's causing a lot of heat damage to those beans. And it doesn't matter how dark the roast is. Heat damage is going to cause a massive negative effect in cup. But whether it justifies going to a 64 Zerno is to be questioned. Um, I would try, again, slow feeding is such a good answer. Um, I would try that and, you know, it'll probably improve your cup immediately anyway. Have I tested convex ripple? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, yeah, that's part of the reason why I came to the conclusion it was um, a really good option. It's willing to slow feed into the Zerno. That's what I've been doing. It's not pointless. Um, no, it's it's always going to help, especially because they're 64 millimeter bursts. So it's going to help. It would be pointless if they were like 120 millimeter bursts with the same auger feeding system. But at 64, it is not pointless. Lance, this video is turbo. Never have a watch live stream where the creator went through all the questions to this level of detail. I you know, I enjoy I enjoy answering them. Thank you. I'll try slow feeder. Let's see, what time are we at? Oh, we're about in an hour. I'm going to stop in two minutes. Oh, wait. Yeah, two minutes. Um, should I try to slow down the feed rate at the Pietro with Probe Reverse? So it, it actually does a decent job at slow feeding because of the way that the ramp in is designed. So essentially what you can do with the, with the Pietro is if you want to slow it down, you just have to tilt it the opposite way. So I guess if you have the base, it's a little harder. But if you wanted to, you could tilt it if you're holding it tilt it back like this and that'll slow it down a lot. But the thing is, is with the hand grinder, it is not, because the RPM is so low, it's not, um, it's not pulling the beans in as fast as it would in a motorized burr system, right? So it's not pulling the beans in as fast. So they're kind of waiting to enter, um, which is actually a really good thing. Um, What's the best way to get good tasting co-ferments? Mine was kind of like off yogurt or co-ferments are just funky. Co-ferments are just funky. I would do a lower extraction though, colder water, shorter ratio, it might taste better, but meticulous are decent. <clears throat> if the meticulous proves itself, then I would prefer the meticulous. Um, I don't, uh, personally, it's quiet. It'll have much more consistent flow because it's using a displacement system. The piston, I find piston driven systems produce better tasting espresso, um, but it's, it's not yet to prove, it, prove itself. And while the decent has its, my, I have my qualms with the decent, it, it does do, um, it does do a decent, a decent job. <laughs> Slow beat feeding beneficial with single dosing. I just feel like there's nothing restricting or putting pressure on the burrs. It, it, it is. It, so the, it is still, yes. So single dosing is where it's most beneficial. If you're hopper feeding, you can't slow dose, right? So I guess if you have a system in place, but slow dosing is still important because when you drop all the beans in at once, you're overwhelming that entry. And so the pre-breaking on every burr set, regardless of cone or flat, is so efficient. It's going to suck in as much as it can those beans. And so... And Samo has said this publicly many times, but if you particle analyze the, the grounds that come out first and the grounds that come out last and the grounds that are in the middle, they're all vastly different particle size. And it's because, or not particle size, but the um, uh, distribution. And it's because there's weight behind those, um, the ones in the middle that are not at the beginning or at the end. And so you have this big difference in these the the way that it's experiencing the throughput and so they kind of get caught at those finishing teeth and while things are being pushed behind it but it takes time to get out and then there's like a traffic jam yada 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 when you slow feed you're disallowing a lot of that to happen okay i think i'm gonna be done because it's over an hour now. Um, thank you so much for everyone attending. I love you all. I love doing this. It's a great time. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna let this video process and then I will post it. Um, uh, but for people watching in the future, it's posted. So uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Thank you. You all rock. And I think that's uh, I think that's it for today. Hope the rant was fun. <laughs> let me take my last sip. Proper cold now. I hope that you brew something tasty today. And cheers. <laughs>